So welcome on behalf of CMC, welcome from me, Sarah Baines. Who thought about two and a half months ago, we were heading to Kids Screen and we were really positive about the world, about the industry and what was going to happen. As we got to Kids Screen, things started to unfold and we never thought that we would be here where we are now uh, and at a point in history that's completely unique. We were in Kids Green in Miami talking about what we would do to go to Hangzhou, which is something we do every year. We go to an event called IABC and we connect and have a very deep relationship with our Chinese colleagues out there. And there has been a lot of business and collaboration that we have done. So when it became clear that this year our mission to Hangzhou wasn't going to be taking place, we decided to sit with DIT and talk about what we could do. What could we do to foster that relationship? DIT or the Department of International Trade are hugely supportive both of CMC but also of the ongoing relationship with China. We also have worked with a CBBC, who are the Chinese Britain Business Council, who have worked with us in terms of how we can come together and do something, even though we're now virtual. So we've got several initiatives. Today we're going to be doing a webinar and we've got an amazing array of speakers that we've pulled together so quickly. So thank you to all our speakers. Also, there will be an event tomorrow which some of you may have signed up to which where we'll have business to business meetings those of you that have missed that we will be um connecting you into iabc who's doing a virtual event next week and then we will be looking in october to hopefully be able to go back today is about strengthening our understanding and relationship of business within China. It's about learning to uh, understand each other, understand how children are working, but particularly at this moment where things are different, we need to understand where we all are now and where the industry is gonna be in about um, six months time, a year's time. So we can start creating and serving each other in a way. Children are children, children are being children since the stone age their their brains and their thirst for story and their thirst for learning hasn't changed the packaging may have changed but they fundamentally haven't changed and our job is to come together collaborate so that we can serve children and the next generation in the best possible way so what we've done today is we've created two different parts we've got the first part which is about informing you what's happening in china now what people are looking for and how you might start thinking about it. Our second part is around when you thought a bit more, how are you going to pitch? What's the best way, whether you're a writer or whether you're an IP owner or a service provider of some kind, how can you connect into China and help them serve the children that we all, all come together and collaborate to, to work towards? We'll do the first part of the webinar and then We'll have a quick change of about a minute while we just swap over speakers and you'll have a holding slide and then we'll come into the second part. So next up, I'd like to introduce you to the speakers. We have uh, a, a, a very illustrious list of speakers today. In the first part today, we have Jean Dong from Vespa Media. We have Man Man Chen from We Kids. We have Olivia Ho from Baizu. And we have Alicia Liu from Singing Grass. So I'm first of all going to start with Jean. Unfortunately, some of you may know that we were going to have CCTV, but they were unable to join us at the last minute. Um, so we're delighted to have Jean. And I'm going to ask Jean if she would join me. Thank you. And Jean, would you like to describe a bit about where you see the market, what you see happening, and how you see your response at Zespa to how you, how you think people could deal with things slightly differently and connect into chi the Chinese market? Thank you, Sarah. 
Um, and thanks everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I'm the chairman of Zespa Media Group of Companies and we are a production uh, licensing and distribution company based in both China and the UK. So we w we've been working in the last 10 years actively with uh, Chinese uh, partners as, and as well as UK creators, producers to bring international uh, collaborations uh, for the China market. So I just thought before I begin and also as the opening of this whole um, China webinar, I'd like to share some of the facts and figures about China and China's children ma market in particular. So just some facts and figures. So from the 1st of January 2016, China had implemented the two-child policy. So now people are allowed to have the second child. And in that very year, the newborn baby have reached 17.5 million by the end of the year. So that was in 2016. And it's estimated by 2025, the Chinese population of children between 0 to 14 years of age would reach 272 million so that's quite soon and there will be hundreds of, of millions of children so that's the market and in terms of children's consumption market in china by the statistics in 2018 uh, the value of chi children's consumption market of china is approximately 4.5 trillion rmb and that's equivalent to 515 billion pounds and the annual growth is estimated to be 20 percent year on year but obviously i think for this year it's going to be slightly less uh due to the uh covid pand pandemics um, when it comes to children's entertainment consumption market the figure shows that in 2018 um, the value is estimated at 52.7 billion pounds and that is um, on an annual growth rate exceeding 30% from 2018 uh, all the way to 2022. So we can see the scale of the market. And we, when it comes to China's media, uh, media market and in terms of broadcasters, just a quick share of the Chinese. Um, there are mainly two kinds of platforms of broadcaster. One is traditional television. So in China, children's TV channels um, altogether enjoying around 800 million viewers per month. So their um, MO, MAU, monthly active users, around 800 million. That's a figure by end of last year. And the top six children's channel in China are CCTV Children, um, Any World TV, which is under Hunan uh, broadcasting system, Kaku, uh, Kaku Cartoon, that's under Beijing, Jia Jia Cartoon under Guangdong, and Ha Ha Cartoon and Yu Men Cartoon. So these are the top six children's channels in China. And they have 800 million viewers per month. And the second type of um, broadcaster is the fast growing streaming platforms. And in China, we uh, the top three by far are Tencent, Aichi, and Yuku. So by, uh, according to the Brand Trends Research Report in 2019, the number of MO, um, MAU for Tencent Kids, which is Tencent's dedicated children platform, is around 457 million. Uh, paid subscribers, 120 million. Uh, IGE Kids has uh, 455 million paid subscribers 100 million and yuku kids have 280 million with paid subscribers 140 million so that's a landscape of china in terms of the kind of broadcasters and our media market so what's popular so far i think we we have it's fair to say that people when it comes to children's content cartoon is by far the most popular content and uh and Ch chinese cartoon is still taking the lead in terms of popularity um according to the joint figures of tencent yuku and ige the number one animation series in china is called uni bear i'm sure a lot of it uh, a lot of you are familiar with that series it's a story of a 
bear family and their friendship and interaction with the hunter family, uh, local villages and wild animals in the, in the forest. So it's extremely popular. Uh, last year, they have a joint uh, viewing number of 3.5 billion, uh, roughly from the top three streamers. Um, that's Chinese domestic cartoon. And uh, Peppa Pig is still uh, remaining the most popular international cartoon. And uh, the joint view, uh, viewership last year was about uh, above 2 billion in China. So, so animation is by far the most popular content for children in China. Um, therefore, we are, I mean, in terms of what we are looking for, we are looking for good international, when it comes to international market and UK in particular, we're looking for good children's IP in the cartoon space. And there are two kinds that we're looking for. One is existing IP that's already been aired, um, liked um, and it could be old I mean it could be a little outdated but we're happy to look at it and revive it we actually have uh, investors giving us a wish list of the kind of IP they are after and they're probably no longer on air but they're good uh, with sound stories good characters so that's the first kind established IP and the second kind when it comes to new project we're looking for new project but created by established creators, writers, um, uh, animation creators. So they need to be pretty uh, award-winning with very good track record because, because it's really hard for anyone to gauge how good a new IP will likely to be. But if it's built and created by a, by a great creator or a team of them, then the, the investors would have more certainty. Um, and that's what we do at Zespa. We're primarily a production company with our independent production house in Beijing. And we produce primarily primetime shows for Chinese TV and online broadcasters. Um, but we also work as a project builder or, we, or you could call it creative agent that identify good project and work with investors, uh, broadcasters, publishers, um, gamers, and all these um, partners that could really build a IP, children's IP, into a long-term success with enduring value. And that's what we do. Um, so just that's a, a kind of a snapshot of what China is like and what we're looking for. That's fantastic. So in a minute, we're going to move on to, to Man Man Chen from, from We Kids. But I'm hearing that's a huge opportunity uh, for content and hopefully content that's going to come from the UK or services that are going to come from the UK. So just to, 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 so we'll come back in the panel and maybe discuss further how, how um, we can do that. So thank you very much, Jean, and we'll come back to you in the panel. Thank you. So Man Man, We Kids. Hi. Many, many of us know We Kids, and as Jean has been saying, she's given us some fantastic stats around the amazing opportunities. Um, which I write down? So, two point seven billion and three percent growth just within our sector in children's entertainment, um, and an array of opportunities. What are you seeing, and what are you seeing changing in the last six months over the period where things have changed slightly? has the appetite for what is wanted changed? Well, uh, I think there are two major changes. The one thing is that uh, probably not within the latest, uh, the last six months, but uh, within the last past year, is because of new regulation of the China government. Uh, there's a huge demand of, you know, local original new content in China. It's not like an import one, but those new content is not only for the China market, but is everybody wanted to be globally sell. So uh, I think not only we kids because we have been developing something of our own, but also for most of the studios and the content creators, we are struggling to create something that uh, you know that could fit for the global market. That we definitely need help from you know, from all over the world, the creators, especially from the UK, which is, I think is, is the center of the content creation in Europe. Okay, there's a third, uh, one thing. The second thing is that within the past, like uh, six months, I can see there's a trend that uh, from the data 
of the you know the streaming platforms or the TV channels. I also have heard some you know things from all the parents in China that uh, people need to have more like uh, more educational content. That is because you know most of the kids are staying at home for a long time, and uh, purely entertaining thing is not you know one of the top list to the parents. But on saying that, it's not to say that uh, you know we need some content that's purely 100% educational, but how to we make it you know educational content into a fun stories. So how to make it fun? How to make it edutainment? You know content. So it's uh, I think it's another challenge for all the creators. So in, you're looking for more educational. Where where are the gaps in the market? Is it preschool? Is it is it older? I think it's more like preschool or even higher to six to nine. Yeah, yeah. Because of, of talk of you know to getting some uh, support from the you know like uh, the UK creators, it's easier for for you to develop a content in preschool. You have don't have to face the conflicts between cultures, countries, or races, different kinds of humans, or even weathers. So make it preschoolers, you know, gonna be easier. And also, uh, preschool is amount of people that they need more like educational content because, you know, the parents choose the, you know, how to, what them let them to see. For higher age, probably they, they just need some, whatever they want, more like entertaining things. And we, we're going to open up more in the, in the panel. Just a quick question about we kids, because you're not only buying and acquiring IP, but you're also creating IP. Yeah, and, exactly. And, and so if people come to you, are you looking for writers? Are you looking for animators? What type of people can approach you with their services as well as their IP? Well, uh, probably I can really make it sure, like I can give two examples, which is, you know, our own developed IP, but uh, also, also represent two different kinds of models, right? And uh, we have a lab, we have a creative lab, in-house creative lab in Suzhou in center of China. We create, you know, something for our own 100%. Like uh, there's one project called the Tan and Jojo show, which is like a preschool show. It's for winter fun and games. And we spent like six months, we uh, developed the designs or stories, whatever. And we have, uh, last year in Annecy, we asked the Cartoon Network to recommend two uh, really good writers from South Africa. And uh, we spent like uh, six months to develop the Bible and the promo, uh, the pilot together. And uh, really good, we get really good feedbacks from the global market. So this is one model is that uh, we need uh, like a writers, creators or uh, you know or even like a uh, animation artist uh, directors and we can help to build our own project so this is one the second second thing is that uh, we all, we are also looking for some really good you know uh, concept at a very early stage from either is tech uh, you know painting books or uh, you know novels whatever is mainly for preschoolers and uh, we we want to find some partners like uh, probably not in individuals, but uh, studios, like studios from UK. And uh, we help to develop no matter what that original ideas from the Europe or uh, from China, but uh, we develop like a, uh, uh, you know, original content for fit for the both market. Yep. That's brilliant. So uh, just um, as we bring up Olivia, um, when we get to the panel, it would be great to talk about how the Brits can really step up and how what what it is that when they're selling to you. So if you can hold that thought, now we've got Olivia on, and when we get to the panel, let's talk about how we can all collaborate and, and what it is that you see in Britain that collaborates. So we'll come okay. back to that one at the at the end. So thank you very much, Man Man. Right, thank you. And welcome, thank you. Olivia. Thank you, Sarah. So, so we'll just I just Quick intro of myself. Yes. So my name is Olivia Howe and I'm the co-founder and chief creative officer for Baozhou. Uh, so for, for our international friends on the call, uh, the, uh, like our famous uh, work was probably Next Gen, the animated feature that lives on Netflix right now. It was, 
it was when, when it was released on Netflix, it was the biggest um, uh, family uh, animation on Netflix that weekend. So very proud of what we did. And it was, uh, we got a theatrical release in China by Alibaba Pictures and Wanda Pictures. Um, and uh, in the last two years, what we've seen was uh, a, a crazy drastic change in the whole entertainment land landscape in China. And uh, especially for movies, <laughs> we, uh, the movie industry is basically wiped out this year. So for our new pro upcoming uh, feature projects, uh, the only thing we can do is to just keep writing. Uh, just f finesse the script. The, the script can never get better. <laughs> um, so uh, until a point when it all comes back up again, then then we roll into production. But on the other hand, we are also seeing growing demand for um, a TV series, like kids' TV series. Um, and what we do, uh, uh, people are very cautious right now. People are very scared to to put up money to new ideas right now. That's why if if you are working on a new IP, uh, a new story, a new set of characters, it will take months, probably years of pitching to get get it sold. Um, so, and that's what we've been trying in the last two years as well. And I want to share my screen very quickly. So uh, this is one of our shows that we're working on right now with, uh, it's a Chinese Canadian co-production. Um, so it's basically the, the, the blood and tears of our experience in the Chinese and global market in the last 10 years and how we consider an IP. So this particular show is, is, is based a center around a TV show. So that's the first thing that we'll be producing. And then you, if you see the second layer, of, second ring around it, these are the immediate uh, 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 sectors that we can tap into to generate cash flow. And then there's the outer layer. So for this show in particular, and it's funny that Mama mentioned education, so maybe we can have a chat after this. So for this particular show, it's because we've been pitching at film festivals, we've been pitching to uh, streaming platforms, it's very hard for a new IP to stand out. So we thought, okay, using our experience in making shows and making original content for the last 10 years, what can we do? What can we do to make it stand out? And immediately we found education as a very, very exciting area to, to be in. Uh, instead of looking at it from the point of view of a content creator, if you look at the point of view from, a, from an educator, uh, the problem that every educator uh, or like uh, big um, educational uh, platforms like, like VIP Kit, for example, they, they don't have high quality contents, right? They, what they do is they, they use very cheap flash, uh, probably like just a hundred, less than a hundred dollars per, per minute to create a whole educational piece. That's their budget. And it's very easy to up that budget. It's very easy to, to, to get them to, to, uh, to realize, okay, this is, so there are more ways to uh, make education fun. So this is where we, where we started. So we thought, okay, so we gonna, we, we, instead of just putting uh, education in there as like, like a label, we want a proper educational aspect to the show. But the show itself, because it's only seven minutes per episode, there, there aren't enough educational material you can put in there. So that got us thinking like, okay, how can we base our IP around the show and then build the rest up? Um, so th so we, then we started looking at working with partners, working, working on our language program, working on our STEAM education program, and, build, and then reverse engineer that, those elements into the show, whatever we can accommodate in the show, we put it in there but the show itself has to be standalone and, and uh, entertaining. So, so the, this, is, this is our first uh, uh, TV development that we can break uh, the international market as well as the Chinese market. And, and then around that are stuff that we've done in the past. And, and, and you can see in the lines like what, what, what these individual uh, module mean, to, uh, how they affect the other modules. Um, and in particular, so this is where, where we look at for other IPs, right? So if you already have an established show, established, established IP, this is how my brain works. So I look at the IP and think, okay, are there merchandising and licensing opportunities that I can immediately jump upon? 
uh, other musical elements that uh, we can we can do a musical release on. So this is basically how we look at an IP and developing an IP. Uh, every IP has a slightly different route. So for this one, the Mimo show is a co-production with a, a Canadian company. Uh, this one in particular was centering around the show. So a lot of, so that's where the money will be spent in first. Once the show is developed and uh, distributed, we will we'll then, then look at the uh, modules and the, and the first circle around it. So merchandising and licensing, music, any publications, then we branch out to bigger stuff. So these are all the things that we do in China at the moment. And we also have an educational partner. Uh, so this is uh, what's special about the show in particular is we're hoping the educational element in the show uh, can make it stand out. But every, every IP has a slightly different route uh, of uh, achieving this map. Uh, so, for example, we also uh, uh, we we uh, the licensed Rage Comic faces. So, for those faces, because they are not a story, they're not IPs, right? So, what we do is we can build them into like WeChat stickers. Uh, we, we distribute the stickers to every possible uh, platform there is. We had a Rage Comic. Uh, uh, a builder, a strip comic builder on our website, people can come in and create their own comics. And then, and then years later, well, we can, now they have merchandising value. Back then, back in the 10 years ago, the, the, there wasn't a nostalgia factor. So for these, these like older emojis, older uh, like meme contents, they suddenly have a, a nostalgic value right now so they there's a huge uh, merchandising and licensing for the older ips if they were known 20 or 30 years ago and they haven't been really developed they can either be uh like it hasn't really continued they can either be revived or they can come back alive in the form of uh wechat stickers so for example tom and jerry like everyone in my uh, wechat moments everyone was mourning the creator of uh, tom and jerry yesterday but you know what people really do with Tom and Jerry nowadays? Use their uh, WeChat stickers. I have more than 10 friends who uses Tom and Jerry as their profile pictures. So that's also a very interesting way of keeping the uh, IP alive, well and alive. Uh, so yeah, every, every IP has its, its own path, but uh, at some point uh, we will love for uh, so for, for purchase and for picking up IPs, we will love IPs that can branch out into a big map like this that we can add elements to it. Uh, so, yeah. So, and uh, also uh, for, for new, like I personally, I love like new IPs because that's where you can uh, find the most exciting stuff. Um, so I'm not afraid of trying stuff out. It takes, it takes time. It takes a lot of time and effort. But if, if anyone has great, great ideas of, uh, or who wants to join us uh, as a writer on our shows, because we have a, a bunch of shows, we also have a couple of movie projects in the making right now. So we always welcome writers. Clash of minds, I love that. I like that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Olivia. And thank you um, that the map is fantastic. I'm going to have to ask you later on if I can take a screen grab so um, and take a further look it's amazing as I say we're going to we, we're going to be coming back to a panel and the, um, uh, we'll we'll continue the discussion then um, I'm going to be asking Alicia if she would like to join us uh, so that we can talk more about the educational side and then Olivia I'd love to come back and talk about that clashing of minds and the and the bringing together of minds so Alicia. Hi. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for, for being with us and, and joining us. You're, you're based in London and I know that you have a particular, you, you're not so much in TV uh, as in publishing. Would you like to tell us a bit about A, what you're doing and B, the reason you're here is we had a really interesting discussion um, when we actually met a, at a Banff event uh, yeah. at Canada House and you talked about that real need to be able to um, get people talking across the across the continents. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm going to attempt to start sharing my screen to start with, so that um, and see if it works. Thank you. Um, 
So I uh, run a, a business consultancy and communications agency advising on access and development strategies for China. We're based uh, actually both in London and in China. We essentially work, it's been in the past 10 years or so, we've been working with some of the leading international book fairs, including the London Book Fair and Beijing International Book Fair. Um, and increasingly, we have been working with some of the content producers, such as the Lego Group and Hachette Children's Group, um, advising them on some of their brand IP strategies for China. And I know the time is very limited here, so I'm going to really focus on talking a little bit more about the emerging education sector within the children's IP. And this is actually something I think all the previous speakers have touched upon. Really to start with, um, I want to emphasize on the fact that actually in, in the past year, one in three books sold in China is a children's title. That just simply show you the size of the children's content market in China. I know in the last year, perhaps entertainment market in China has experienced a huge shift in terms of you know, they're trying to encourage homegrown content. The same happens in publishing, and yet it's still a very open market. You can see some of the small niche British publishers doing really well in China. And I guess we have to acknowledge that the COVID-19 has completely reshaped the educational landscape in China in the past four months. What we've seen is the, the very tech savvy Chinese audience already they're going further online, not just for shopping, but also they're looking for entertainment content, also for learning. So you've seen crazy numbers such as Ding Talk, which is the online platform backed by Alibaba, has in, in the first day, mid-February, when people back online, back, back to virtual school, they've seen 50 million students signed up and over 600,000 teachers signed up. I think in terms of entertainment sense, we've seen some of the very mature IP has, doing, has been doing really well. I think one of the best sellers during the COVID-19 in China is Piper Pig teaches you how to speak English. And I think the final point I want to emphasize is in China now, everything is really media and social is everywhere. I think social media is something in China beyond the, the concept of social media. A, a kid's kind of Get, get to know certain IP or certain content through play with it, actually through video and watch it, listen to it, and now even read books through video talks um, because all the physical bookstores close, but it's gradually open, but still you're seeing some of the key opinion leaders talking about certain interesting books through video talks. Um, things like TikTok, I think in the West is, is most popular for teenagers, but in China it's cross age groups. Um, it's something I think if you are looking at to, to bring the, the kind of brand IP alive in China, something you really need to focus on in terms of the brand touch points through both the traditional online streaming channel and also the social media presence. I think this, I know I've got only three minutes. <laughs> I'm trying to stick and then hopefully open up a bit of conversation afterwards. That, that, that's, that's great. And I, I, I can see lots of people wanting to be in touch to talk more about maybe their IP going through a book um, rather than going straight for a TV. And, and several people that have come with us to Hangzhou have developed up their books and then got them through into China and being successful with books in China. So that's an interesting, uh, different medium because at CMC, we cover all medium. We focused a bit more on TV today because of Hangzhou and animation, but uh, it's something that's potentially the, the UK could think about it as a route into China. We're going to open up into the panel now and um, if we can bring up the others because several people talked about education. Uh, we had, I think everybody touched on it in some shape or form. And it, it, I'd just like to ask all of you, when you look at a project, how educational does it need to be? What are the key points? Do you have a quota system? What is it that, you think would be the right balance within a pitch in terms of education? Should we start with Olivia? Um, 
yes. So when and so I'm, I'm going to share my pitching experience. Uh, I get asked that every time I pitch my my project. Um, so the show itself should be standalone, entertaining. Otherwise, if you lose lose viewership, your educational aspect won't mean anything, right? But on the back of that, you have to demonstrate that you actually have a solid curriculum in place. Uh, those would be the additional add-on material they can find somewhere, maybe maybe through an app, maybe on on, on YouTube, uh, additional clips, whatever way it is. There needs to be a a, a proper uh, curriculum that supports the show. Otherwise, it's just the the the, the educational label just becomes an, an, an empty title, right? But within the show itself, uh, maybe that you touch upon, if the story allows, you can touch upon a particular aspect, like how is fire created, or you can touch upon a particular scientific topic. That's that's easy to build story around. But uh, I don't, I don't force my writers to have to be very educational every episode. They have to be interesting, fun adventure stories first. Uh, if we can build science in there, let's build it in there. If not, not forced. Uh, we can always find ways to to teach using the, the material. Maybe maybe you see a dinosaur in the in, in in the story, but we don't we don't teach you about this particular dinosaur. You have fun, you have adventure, you get you chase, you fight the dinosaur in the show. But then after the show, the the add-on material, uh, you have to have like a proper uh, bit on uh, dinosaurs. That's, that's that's how I pitch my show, and and that can guarantee both uh, proper education and both entertain uh, proper entertainment. Thank you very much, Mama. Ma have you got anything you'd like to add to that? Well, actually, I'm uh, eighty percent you know agree with Olivia, and uh, you know, based on our, my experience, that uh, there's kind of a difference between you know in you know the requirement of uh, educational content in China and in other places. Who, of the world, because we have been talking to, we work with the international writers. We're talking to, like the producers in the U.S. and in Europe, and uh, also some local, you know, the potential partners. That, uh, you know, for the global market, it seems like, especially for the preschoolers, uh, you don't have to just like Olivia said. You have to make it fun at the first priority, and to to take secondly whether you can put enough educational content into your stories. But in China, there is a demand that's more people need more, especially for some parents. I've been asked by a, you know the Chinese like broadcasters, because uh, in our show there's a slightly like a one or two minutes for more like educational content, and all the like a five or six minutes for fun. We can simply divide it like that. And he goes like, uh, what if you cut out the one or two minutes educational things to make a new series, short version for like a mostly 100% educational? I'm, I'm going like, well, is the kids gonna like that? But that gentleman says like, uh, you know, we can make a channel in the platforms. Like uh, this purely educational things and we can you know, get a lot of hits. So it's, uh, we are trying to you know, face a challenge and try to balance the, you know, the, these two conflicts. But uh, it is the truth. This is the fact. Yeah. So thank you very much. Just because we're short on time, Jean. One of the questions we've had from uh, the audience um, is around how to smaller companies connect into China, whether that's on education or on other things. But if you're a small player, how do you go out and find a team and then connect into China? Uh, yeah, well, I think um, actually uh, one thing I would like to mention that in China, in the media market, things operate slightly differently. Um, there's virtually no broadcaster that kind of actually straightforwardly commission a program. They normally don't commission them. It's really um, companies like Olivia's, uh, Alicia and, and Mamas, they are the ones creating and investing in creating content with international partners. So definitely um, they're the kind of partners you should work with either in publishing or animation production or even advertising. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of sponsors getting on board to to fund animation. So we, uh, we would recommend for them to, to be in touch with those and then you can expand into having more partners if it's proven to be a solid IP with potential. And, and uh, Alicia, have you got anything? 
Yeah. Um, I just want to add on in terms of, how, you know, how, like how, how educational you need your content to be. That earlier, um, you know, Olivia and, and Maman all mentioned, um, you kind of break it down, I guess, by different age groups, with preschoolers. And what we've seen in publishing is this huge booming of picture books in China. It's something that doesn't exist before. And suddenly in the past three years, you know, I think over 60% of the picture books sold in China by international authors. That just shows how much capacity you could be. But moving upwards from school in China start a bit later compared with the UK, starts not until six. So kind of from five to nine onwards, you're looking at a very, very kind of, I think the top spending, I was looking at the Tencent um, research, um, top percentage spending on children's content is actually on education comparing in the west i think that age group is more on books so it's kind of i think there's a much more straightforward emphasis on education um with last april i think the ministry of education in china has included steam as official curriculums for school in terms of compulsory teaching you've seen a huge surge on like art subjects in terms of you know books and both like tv programs even the palace museum in in beijing is becoming a huge live streaming platform um and they 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 have their own ip and you know in terms of kind of both emojis offline licensing um books and everything else um are moving upwards from like 10 to say 15 so kind of um towards end of primary school Junior, um, junior school in China, and it's it's straightforward. Kind of, I think that the aspirational Chinese parents have huge hope for their children. You know, they they're looking forward much more in terms of um, reading literacy. So anything they watch, if they allow their kids to watch, it has to be something with with kind of big learning values. And and I think that's um, that's something happens in the West. You know, I've seen BBC this week now started launching a huge educational initiative and, and the Oak Academy online was now everybody is locked at home. Um, but in China, it, it's, it's, it's more explicit and it's something that you can just say quite upfront at your pitch, really. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, everybody. Um, I, I think everybody has a really good picture of that positive change and the fact that there are opportunities that all of you are open for business um you know, alicia in terms of, of publishing in in the uk and again jean uh who is very much looking at how to connect people into china and how to potentially look at getting projects together and helping on that side so um you're, you're interested in those and olivia you know we didn't get to talk about about the you know the clashing of minds but i'm going to pick up the phone and hopefully maybe do something later in the year with you on on clashing minds and man man oh. as you know as as ever um you know, we kids have been so much part of what we've done so thank you very much for coming on uh, and sharing what you're doing and hopefully we'll get you more in the uk and doing more in the uk and some projects up and running we're entering the second part of the webinar today. This session, the last session painted a picture of what was happening within China. This session is to inspire you to get on a pitch. As you may know, there are two different opportunities this week. Uh, one is with uh, the CMC and the one-to-ones, which has now closed. And then next week we have the ability to go into IABC and pitch. We've asked some, some of our uh, China friends to come along and talk about how best to pitch into China, whether you're a writer, whether you're a service provider, whether you've got IP. We're delighted to start off with Ching Fang from Tencent, who is going to talk to us about what Tencent are looking for and give us a bit of the landscape of what Tencent uh have at the moment and what what would really make them tick so ching over to you thank you sarah um thanks for having me great to be here um my name is ching fan i'm the producer at tencent video kids channel overlooking the international business including content investment and co-production 
Um, I'm going to briefly talk about Tencent Video and Kids Channel. Um, so Tencent Video was established in 2011 as an important part of Tencent's overall strategy, uh, media and entertainment sector. It provides a variety of premium content, including movies, uh, TV series, documentaries, uh, variety shows, sports, and news. Um, by the end of last year, it has 100.6 million subscribers in a single market and uh, remains the leading player in the country. Um, Kids Channel uh, attracts the second largest streaming on Tencent Video, right after drama. Um, our targeted uh, demographic group are under age of 14 years old with the core uh, under age of 10 years old. We started to co-produce with domestic animation studios for the original content from 2016. Um, we had produced or uh, is producing over 30 original content until today, uh, including Super Boomy with Trevor, of course, uh, who was among the first few partners when we started and now coming into the third season of the production in this year. And uh, a yet to announce to project with James uh, recently. Um, we started to look at the international, uh, you know, uh, in-depth partnership from late 2018 when I joined the team. And uh, we've been actively looking for good kids content across all markets, including the UK. Well, maybe especially the UK, uh, given its um, strong creative tradition and the talent it houses. Um, and what we are looking for, we are interested in kids and family content in general, upper preschool, six to nine, from kids' point of view. Animated, preferably, uh, long or short form. We are interested in, uh, we are uh, open to, you know, in co-development and co-production opportunities across our genres. Um, accepting pitches, which um, features the maybe uniqueness, I would say. Shows should have uh, a global appeal and easily adapted, um, adaptable for multiple regions. Um, uh, but uh, I have to add one thing. I would say our channel uh, school more entertaining than educational. So we're probably not looking at um, hardcore educational content. Um, although we do have a dedicated uh, kids streaming product uh, called Tencent Video Kids, which, is, uh, which features its uh, more uh, educational and uh, interactive functions like DIY or language learning. I hope it helps. But in addition to that, we will generally looking at content that's um, school more entertaining, I would say. And how do you like people to pitch to you? Uh, well, feel free to send to us. I mean, we, we will be, I mean, we'll be basically appearing in all key markets, if, if not this year. I mean, um, well, uh, and if not in the market, uh, feel free to send your development materials, preferably uh, with Bible, one or two scripts at least, and uh, a teaser. If people want to just send you a one pager, does that, do, just to say, is this something you might be interested in? Is that, or do you want the, the, the whole worked up project each time? We want to read scripts maybe at least one or two, that would be better rather than, you know, uh, 
I would say, a, a single page. That's good. And are you also looking for service providers? So are you looking for people that you can pair up with, with companies that are, or an IP that you found in China? So writers or animators? Um, yes, we do, but uh, probably not at the early stages um, because at the moment, um, uh, I mean, for our original content, I mean, like a hundred percent produced by Tencent uh, Video Kids channel, we, we surely will look at service uh, providers. But uh, right now, I think we 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 uh, we are more looking at the creative, uh, you know, the early creative ideas. We 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 will. I mean, we uh, we do look at all the, uh, you know, uh, service studios, our creative talents, to maybe to work for, uh, how to say, Tencent Productions, Tencent, a hundred percent produced content. Mm -hmm. So you're you're willing to take uh, pictures and and people get in contact you you if there's if there's service providers as well if they've got scripts that they've they've done before that they can demonstrate their craft to you. Um, that yeah. Be best. Yeah, we do. We do looking, uh, you know, looking forward to work with all the creative creative uh, talents, including the service studio, of course, um, for high quality productions. And what, what type of shows work well for you? Um, again, uh, I'm saying like we accept pitches um, across all genres. Um, not as well as it's not hardcore or educational. Um, it's okay if it's edu educational, um, I mean, uh, edutainment, I mean. Um, so uh, I wouldn't say there is a particularly specific type of shows. Okay. Just, uh, no, so so, so you're, you're, you, you haven't got a, a, a um, specific target, which means that people can feel free to send things in if they've got that, that lightness about them whether they've got education but, uh, behind them, it's a lightness and, and yeah. fun. Yeah, but I do, I do can add something, uh, maybe it will be helpful. Um, it's, it's uh, have to say um, right now, it's a little competitive for uh, preschool, preschool content mm -hmm. at our platform. But uh, again, I guess it's the case for pretty much all the kids content uh, platforms, I mean. Uh, for six to nine, it's not that competitive uh, if it would be helpful. But uh, again, we, we tend not to exclude an, any good content mm -hmm. for either preschool or six to nine. It's when you see something amazing, you'll make room for it. Um, but you've got some capacity or more capacity in the six to nine bracket if people are looking at what, what they should be working up and what they should be talking to you about. Um, I wouldn't name very specifically, but uh, um, again, I think it's good if uh, the show, uh, we, we, we value the uniqueness very much, uh, you know, from the uh, being a storytelling or graphic design. It's like something um, you've never seen before. And when you say it, you just, you know, have this, um, idea of want to you know um, read more or or have it on your platform. Um, I would say um, we've always want to uh, trying to lift up a little of our demographic uh, targeted uh, age group. So uh, it would be helpful uh, if we can say some like wonderful shows for six to nine or uh, or even you know. Uh, six to nine plus. I've got a quick question in the Q&A, which is how does Tencent feel about comedy? Comedy with kids. We welcome comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, uh, uh, um, as long as it's not too dialogue driven, 
because that might be a little, uh, you know, uh, lost in translation issues, I would say. Um, yeah, I mean, other than that, we, we welcome the comedies. That's brilliant. And um, we may come back to this question in the, in the panel because I'm about to bring in Trevor, but somebody's asking about teenagers, which I'm sure will cut across everybody. But do you have a, a, any need for programs for teenagers? Um, our targeted uh, teenagers is a little um, over, but uh, although I'm saying like our core audience are under age of 10 years old, but uh, start from this year, we do uh, started to looking at um, maybe live actions, uh, if that could lift a little, uh, you know, age wise. Teenagers is, is still like maybe uh, um, as long as it's under 14, I would say, we can try that. There you go. That's uh, opening a, 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 new, a new group. Um, so we're going to move to Trevor. So thank you, Ching, and we'll come back to you when we do the panel discussion at the end. So thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Trevor. Hello. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Hi, Trevor. How are you? Hi, fantastic. Hi, everyone. So we've got a huge amount of participants, who many of whom know you, but for those that don't, do you want to do a quick intro and then it would be great if you can just give us some insight as somebody that has come if, while you were born in China, you then went to, to Canada and then you've gone back and set up two studios in China. So you're very much one of our people that bridges the gap, who understands what pitching might be like from a a European perspective because we have others not just UK people on this call and how how we can take that and make it resonate within the Chinese market because this calls about let's get some business done <laughs> sure yes well uh, I'm an author and illustrator I started in children's books uh, and uh, I founded my company up studios to create original IP for the Chinese market and the global market so I think we were really unique in that when I founded the company, I knew that the domestic market had a huge opportunity within China because it would have a, I predicted, you know, about a decade ago um, that there'd be an insatiable de demand for kids content. And so we founded with that in mind, just producing original IP that would work here, but also knowing the international market, as you alluded to, given my background, you know, wanting to have shows that would not get lost in translation. Um, you know, once they were sold overseas. So I think finding that perfect balance between the two took a few years, uh, but we were very fortunate to have uh, our partner at Tencent, and it's great to see uh, Qing Fan on the call today, um, you know, to, to invest in our show, Super Boomy, along with uh, a, a few other shows that were uh, created domestically. And of course, as you may know by now, uh, Boomy is uh, just eclipsing 3.7 billion views in three years. And Tencent has since invested in another one of my shows uh, called Piggy. And I've also got a third secret show in production uh, that's in production in the UK. Um, for that show, I'm the executive producer and the creative director. So we've got quite a few things going on here and very happy to uh, you know, speak with the panel and, and with your guests on the call today and, and talk about creating original IP here. That's fantastic. And, and your numbers are amazing. I, I can remember we, we met you at Kids Screen many years ago and then you set up your studios and you set up with a, an emoji that you showed me because you'd launched it for Valentine's Day and that went straight in at number one in the Apple Store in China. So yeah. in terms of you understanding creative and how to connect that storytelling, whether it be in a, in a, in a, in a GIF or in, in, in a longer story, what is it you think that works particularly well for, for China? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, it's funny you should mention apps. Like nowadays, almost nobody starts with apps anymore, which tells you how fast the market moves. Um, and that's one of the things that as I've had the pleasure of speaking at CMC events and things like that, um, I always try to make sure that all of your members and, and the guests are keeping up to speed with how quickly the market changes here in this very moment. I think in this very moment, uh, as Chief Fan alluded to, there's, and, and some of your earlier speakers, 
you know, there is this great hunger for content that is not just for preschool. I think as you move up to the six to nine category, that's one that I'm looking at as a creator um, and, you know, to position our next shows. I think balancing for the Chinese market specifically, the educational value, again, that your other speakers have alluded to, but finding a way to really weave that into the stories is a lot harder than I think it sounds. Uh, a lot of people start their pitches and I've taken many, many pitches um, because I do also help Tencent in terms of looking at deals and, and projects I think are good. You know, I, as their partner, I'm happy to recommend them um, to our, our partners there. But uh, I have to say a lot of times people will say, you know, it's educational, um, and, but it's entertaining and it's really just more educational. Or they'll say it's, you know, it's very entertaining, but there's education in it, but it's really just entertaining. So I think understanding how to weave the two components together um, so that they feel like they're part of the storytelling and making that seamless. I think that's a real craft that hasn't yet been uh, per, maybe like mastered uh, to, to the full extent that it could be. Um, it's something that we look at for, for shows like Peggy, for example. Um, but I think it's something that any of the creators on this call today should really think about if that's an important aspect for your show. If it's not, then of course the entertainment um, is something that a lot of channels are just looking for great entertaining shows. And in terms of how, you know, what, what you're looking for and how people come to you, you alluded to the, the project you've got in the UK, which came out of a, a chance conversation at Kids Screen a year and a, a bit ago. So what is it when you start talking to people without going, you don't need to go into that deal, but what is it that makes you think, I'd like to work with somebody outside China, that this is an advantage rather than more complication? What, what, what was it that, that made you go forward with that one? That's a great question. Um, so one of the things I, I, you know, I love meeting all the people that we do meet at Kids Screen, but I, I try to respect people's time by focusing on seeing if there's an opportunity for them in China for whatever their service or their product is at the moment that they approach us. So sometimes a creator will have an idea that I think will require a lot of work, like so much work to redevelop for China that, you know, I, I will often just tell them, well, if this is the idea that you want and you want it to look like this when it comes to China, I, I don't necessarily think that that's the right fit for us. Um, but in the case of the project that we did, um, you know, end up producing in the UK, I think what attracted me to our partner in the UK was their body of work was very impressive. So you heard Ching Fan mention earlier the importance of high quality. Um, that's something that is for Up Studios, we look at for all our partners, whether they're writers or artists or designers um, or merchandisers. You know, we really look at that quality aspect. And so I was blown away by the portfolio. And we started off on a very small project. And it was such a great pleasure working together. Once we had this huge, um, you know, seven figure project, then I was able to say, who do I trust? And, and who can I get on board? And, you know, we actually talked to a number of partners and it was a, is a worldwide search where I talked to a lot of my partners around the world, literally. Um, and we finally came back to a studio that I had worked with, that I felt comfortable with. And, um, you know, I felt like that was something that is built through trust and through experience. Um, and I think the body of work. So if you're a service studio and you wanna work in China, I think obviously your portfolio uh, is something that you're constantly refining, but I think really trying to hone in on what makes your studio unique and different than other studios. So for example, I think some studios really pride themselves on having a very efficient pipeline and being able to produce work that looks perhaps even more high end than it actually costs. Um, and then other studios really are strong in design. So they create really wonderful characters that the minute you see them, you know, you don't forget them. And, and so I think that's sort of a, a different angle that you can look at. As a writer, um, I think really focusing on what makes your writing really fantastic for the Chinese market. Um, and then sending those samples only, I would say. Um, you know, typically if you're getting a chance to show it to a platform, They've got limited time and a lot of people knocking on their doors. So I think hand picking a couple of your writing samples that you think would work in China because you've done the research, I think goes a long way. Um, so I think those are just a few things off the top of my head. 
So we're going to, I'm going to um, bring in James in a minute. And when we get to, to the panel, there, there, there's quite a few questions coming through. Um, and one that I'll, I'll leave you thinking about, we need to come back to, is about singing and songs in preschool shows. So we can come back to that. And so now we have James. And we'll we'll come back to that other question. So thank you, Trevor. We'll we'll come back to you, James. We're we're going to run a, um run over a little, but um if you could just give us a a top line about you, young, but also the creative side of what is it that excites you when a pitch comes in? What is it that works? And where do you see uh, European? or non-Chinese pitches maybe not landing as they could and what can people do to up, up the ante on that one? Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, um, I just give a uh, very short introduction about Yuya and uh, Yuya has quite many years uh, history in China for kids and the family content, entertainment and the media. I think this year is the 20, yeah, it's the 20th years for uh, for our company's history. So my main job is run the studio and for the content creation, production, and also work with my partner for the branding distribution. And uh, yeah, I have been uh, with uh, Sarah's panel for many times and it's my, always my big pressure to come um, here and to make the new friends in this industry. And uh, for me, I, I'll, when I start thinking about what kind of the message I should deliver in this panel, I'm, I just come back to many years ago about my motivation into this industry. So what bring me to this industry? And actually I'm the people very like the, I'm the people believe, who believe the power of the storytelling. I'm the people believe the power and, and of animation. So I think animation is one kind of the art, one kind of the explorations. So they have his unique power to deliver the message, especially for the kids. So I know a lot of people talking about educational content, but I'm the people also believe the power of the story and also the power of animation. So for you young right now, and uh, look at my pipeline, I'm still um, focused a lot of the project like the comedy show, action show, comedy action show, or action comedy show. So, and all, but the recently my thinking is about how to make a good project in this kind of age. And, uh, you know, we have the joke say we cannot make the fast, cheap, and the good at the same time. So you have to pick two of three. And I will pick maybe slow and uh, good, but a reasonable budget. And uh, the, re uh, the reason that I have uh, 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 just uh, green, almost the green line one of our in-house developed show. And uh, I, I just tried to uh, approach some new way, which is we, before we talking about a lot of like to produce 52 episodes or 26 episodes, 20, uh, uh, 26 half an hour, this kind of format. But I think right now I'm going to try some new formula. Just, uh, I won't produce many, many episodes. I will produce few episodes, but the, every quality of episodes will be very good. And then they even have the different kind of the art style. And, but I will thinking, talking with my partner who is in charge of the branding and find a way to do the branding at the beginning, even before we launch the show. And we also will be worked with the artists very flexible way and just build a lot of side content, promotional content, and with the main body of the content, main body of the episodes. So we leave the main body of the episodes still told the story, set up the characters, but we also have a lot of the different format content, side content to support this branding. And the build branding will be my goal. So I, I think it's something I'm thinking and I'm trying right now. So I, I think here, I would like to share my thoughts with the people and uh, if 
and then one have this kind of the idea, which um, I think we can talk. And uh, be honest with you, because this kind of the situation, we will we want to, to pay much attention to look at uh, the very typical show. And but of course, if the show is very very unique, it's the very very different. It's still welcome, but I will look. For me, I'm still looking after. Sorry, uh, I will look after how the unique and how the flexible and how the power of the art, how the power of the storytelling and how the power of the animation in that pitched idea. So it's the basic ideas in my mind right now. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll come back at the end, but, uh, um, but while, we, while we wait for Simon's come up, um, in terms of meeting people, as you say, you're, you're very much part of the CMC family. You're at a lot of the markets and you're accessible. Yeah, I, we were recalling at the beginning, uh, before we went on air, of uh, you know, a project which is now live where we started off sitting on cardboard stools in Hangzhou with a British broadcaster and you, and that's ended up with a project. So it is about relationship building. It does take time. Yes. We intended that conversation to be a pitch either way. It was about a meeting and a growing uh, relationship. Yes. So um, how, my question to you, maybe we, we'll hold this one for the, for the panel, is how are we going to do that more virtually? And hopefully we'll all be back in Hangzhou soon, but while we wait for Hangzhou to come back online, <laughs> what can we do? Okay. So thank you very much, James. Simon. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, we've known each other for many years and when we met in Kids Screen earlier in the year, you explained that you were now working um, with a Chinese company and we talked a bit about how people might pitch, what they might do and we'd love you to share a bit about you and what brings you to the table and then a bit about how you think people can create projects that are going to land within the Chinese market and not necessarily just in TV. Sure well I mean I think the best thing is that I just share the particular story I had and people can draw conclusions from that. I mean um, I'm a writer and writing children's television and books for um, a long time um, and I was introduced by a Korean company I was working for to Alpha, who are a big, um, huge toy company based in Guangzhou, China, um, and have made wonderful toys, but also wonderful television series based on their toys like Super Wings. Um, and they got in touch with me asking me to meet in London and said they were looking for a science fiction adventure comedy show um, for six to ten year olds. And I had an idea which I hadn't shown to anyone, but which I was interested in working on, which I shared with them. Um, very briefly, the idea is called Battle of the Bugs, and it's about um, robot insects who invade the world and children who become bug-like to attack them back. Um, and I shared this idea. They were very, very interested in it. Um, and I think they liked, obviously they're a toy company, they liked the idea of the toys. They, I think, and they would probably say more about this, but they thought it was international. But I think most of all, they seem to really, really engage with the story and the themes and the characters and the particular way I was wanting to tell the stories. Um, so anyway, we went ahead with the development. And I think in my experience, people often talk about working with different countries, about how different it is and the differences. I have to say, from my experience, I found it in a wonderful way, very, very similar to working with any company in the UK or the US or the other countries I've worked in, um, in that we, we did the deal, which was normal. And then I started doing what I normally do, building up the world and creating it. And the conversations were extremely interesting. Um, the two things I would, I would note about this particular collaboration was one, Alpha's incredible energy. Um, once they decided they liked the idea, they moved very, very quickly to get a deal together. And also, um, once I'd started making it in my mind, it quickly got to say you wanted to visualize it. 
and I um, proposed, um, they asked me for to recommend a, um, a studio in the UK or Canada and I recommended Jellyfish who are based in London who I think work is just extraordinary and they just immediately went and got on board and met them and actually that has now grown to um, not only in Jellyfish did they visualize the world quite amazingly but also Alpha have formed a co-production partnership with them for Battle of the Bugs so again that's further energy and drive which is as a writer it's fantastic to have that invested in one's one's work. Um, the second thing I'd say, and this is purely from a writing point of view, the, the conversations we had um, at the beginning, but all the way through about what the, what the idea was, what the story was, um, were just extremely interesting with Alpha because, uh, and here is something where the differences are part of it, They're, they knew a huge amount about Western television, um, often more than I did, and I know quite a lot, it's quite, quite amazing. But um, also they introduced me to lots of references, which I just didn't know about from television and books from Northeast Asia, not just China, but Korea and Japan. So I went away and I watched TV shows like Macross Frontier, um, which I'd never seen before. And um, extremely interesting for the project, but frankly, very, very interesting for me. I mean, I found it very opening up of my own imagination and references. Um, and so it really, I mean, it's, it's been, a fantastically productive um, collaboration. And uh, we're now at the stage where we're presenting it to the market and getting um, very positive feedback. So it's a good story. And, and so in terms of, because I, I, I've been pitched to you, as I say, many by you many years ago, in terms of the clarity of the pitch, and we've heard from Ching about going in with a lot of assets, Clearly, everybody has different things. We've had Olivia's mind map of how to create something. What do you think if you've got uh, five minutes with somebody, what would be the key things that you would put into that pitch? Um, well, again, I can only really talk about this particular encounter and how it worked with me. I mean, I, um, I just tell people a story. And um, I mean, also what I'm bringing to the table is the story and the writing of it. So I'm not able to present huge amounts of visual material. It's not what I do. Um, so I really just arrived with the story I wanted to tell. And um, they had the area they wanted to make in, which was six to 10 sci-fi comedy. So that was a big thing. Um, and I, I had the meeting, I talked to them, and then actually, then I do what I always do, which is I, to crystallize the idea in just two, three pages. Um, and that's not much, but it's um, not much to produce, but it's quite an important process to get it right. And I often start, not always, but I often start my shows like that. And then what I was going to them with was the idea of then coming on board with them and developing together and creating scripts and a full Bible. So, Thank you very much. I think we're going to move on because we're, we're um, fitting everybody in. But while we while we bring in um, Pablo, what I wanted to, to just pick up on and that was as the receiver of something, whether it be a writer, I'm I'm visualizing in my head when I was a commissioner what that story is. So it's lovely to have graphics. It's lovely to have more. But actually, as a writer, your skill is in painting that picture in my mind and I'm taking that picture and playing it onto a screen. It's not it's not necessary to have the rest useful. But what you've just described as your two pager, if it's crafted and shaped so that I can pick that story up as you would in a book, you make your own visuals. So. Well, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's that's very much what it is and I mean I think that you could see that as in there are no visuals or you could talk about the fact that the writing generates all sorts of possible visuals yeah um, exactly. it. but, but it's making it come alive off the page as you write it rather than <laughs> writing I see quite a lot that's stereo in you know, a very stereotyped and quite corporate rather than making it come into a story um, so thank you very much we'll come back to you in a, in a minute or two for, for a quick panel so thank you Simon thank you. and Pablo Thank you very Hi. much and thank you for bearing with us. Um, we've again known each other, met in Hangzhou and uh, worked together on various things. Could you perhaps give us 
um, a glimpse of the landscape now and a bit about how you're working and how people you think would best be positioning themselves um, in the coming weeks and months where we're not we're not live and we're not able to come over um, so any top tips over okay. to you um, hello everyone um, and uh, thank you very much Sarah for uh, having me here uh, my name is Pablo and Meng I work for a company called Hangjin Shambhala Cultural uh, where I am the head of international corporation there uh, and uh, I also work for the 100% subsidiary, wholly owned subsidiary of Hangjin Shambhala, which is called Blossom Pictures. I work as the VP marketing there. Um, what Hangjin does uh, is quite integrated and we, we work on technology, we work on entertainment and we now officially work in education as well. I hear that word being mentioned many times uh, within uh, this meeting. Uh, right now, uh, Hongxin's focus is on one piece of uh, product. Uh, it's, a, it's an intelligent, it's a smart product. Uh, it's called Full House. Um, it's a device, which is a camera and a microphone operated um, OTT box, uh, but it's also a phone app. So it's enabled both by the TV and the phone. It is an AI companion to the kids. It is a remote parenting tool for the parents. It is an education and entertainment content platform for both generations, but most of all, it is a unifying tool for the once or already separated uh, generations by the phone screens. Uh, and the other business directions that we reach on our, uh, virtual reality. Uh, we invested in a Hollywood-based uh, virtual reality company called the Virtual Reality Company. Uh, they have uh, titles like Godzilla vs. King Kong and uh, Jurassic World uh, in production or in market. Uh, and uh, we have the location-based entertainment business. Uh, we're working with uh, Weta Workshop on projects like the uh, Zhuhai Macau Traditional Chinese Medicine Museum, uh, where it has an assorted amount of uh, linear and non-linear content on exhibits. Uh, and we also develop original IPs uh, with uh, overseas partner, uh, New Zealand-based uh, Kukeko Pictures, uh, where we co-produced two preschool shows. Uh, one is called The Cadets and the other is called the Book Hungry Bears, uh, both distributed across the world uh, and in China. Uh, the, well, I co-produced on both of these shows. So these are the many things that, that we do. Um, and um, by me there, Sarah, I, I, I guess I just put out a lot um, on the table, uh, but um, in terms of virtually working, uh, I guess, Right now, uh, we're doing that a lot uh, with our existing partners, um, both from uh, a client and a service providing uh, kind of scenario, but also a uh, co-producer, co-producer kind of scenario. Uh, we convene meetings like this uh, almost every four or five hours these days. But what it is, is that I, I, I generally find things that are uh, different to a face-to-face -face meeting uh, or a phone call is that the communication is very broken down into um, chunks uh, of monologues. You can't really have uh, dialogues with multiple people. Um, speaking all at the same time, because that's just how Zoom and Skype and, and WeChat work. Uh, that's how you optimize um, voice transmission, voice data transmission, and believe it or not, Hengjin used to be um, a tech uh, solution provider for China Mobile on that. 
And um, what that means is that you have to be very, very, very prepared. Um, you, have to, you have to have a very um, formally, generate, uh, formally established agenda and you gotta stick to that. And everyone has to know exactly what they're talking about. Otherwise, it'll easily, easily spin into uh, meaningless um, conversations that really slow everyone down. And this is the one very, I guess, um, impression that I've had uh, with um, working within the COVID-19 time, yeah. It's getting that balance, and we'll we'll open it out in a minute to the to the panel. But it's getting that balance between being too clipped and too formal, and trying to get everybody on track. Um, and and the format has changed as we've discovered today. You know how you how you bring people in and out, what you do, so that you you have people focused. I just want to just very there's two things. Um, one that comes to mind from what you've just said is we had the wonderful Martin from Pakeco who was on our panel at CMC last year. And one of the things he talked about was how he comes from New Zealand and he works with you and how they'd had, you know, the mindset is slightly different in terms of being a service provider. And as, an, as a, a nation, they produce things, they, they create things, but they also work in a slightly different way as co-producers. How would you say that uh, that comes across? Uh, I'm sorry, are you referring to the different sort of creative cultures between the countries or? On, on, the, on, on the panel when he was talking, he was talking about um, <clears throat> perhaps not throwing all your creative juices in so that there became too much tension. He was talking about how you have to have a mindset that is about how do we take this project forward together and more as a team project rather than somebody trying to pull it in one way or the other way. And that, yeah. that he felt it changed yeah. and that working with, with the teams in China had, had developed into very much a team, team players. Yeah, I, I guess, um, I felt that a lot. Uh, I felt that he, he was um, kind of trying to remain patient and he, he actually has a lot in his thoughts, but he's just holding them, holding them, holding them and trying to find the best way to convey them. Uh, I guess that is one awareness to be borne in mind all the time when you have co-producers on board and especially they're not just capital partners. They are your actual creative partners um and that's why you also got to be very very cautious in terms of choosing them uh you know once once they're on board uh you, you better you better run with that relationship and respect them uh and yeah so thank you very much um as we as we pull in the panel i have one question which i i've um we, we've talked about a couple of times which is about just being aware of cultural differences and I wonder, we were at the BBC last year and we were talking about Danger Mouse and you came up with a very good point about Danger Mouse and, and China. Do you want to, to retell the story? <laughs> well, um, I, I figured I, I probably was saying something along the lines of around cheese was not the most popular uh, food for kids in China or at least it's not as widely consumed in the West and that some people either they have uh, a lactose intolerance uh, or that they just hate the smell but um, it, it just doesn't really have that same context when it's being referred in a comedic uh, context uh, in a story I guess that was what I was referring to um, so it, there are a lot of these kind of cultural, I guess, differences or traps uh, to fall into where the Westerners, when they're creating scripts and they're creating stories, they feel it's so natural, it's just so low hanging fruit, you just put it there, but the Chinese would, would just respond and go, what are you doing there? But before you go to that, there are, these are the kind of case by case analysis that you have to just, just really pay close attention and have a cultural, uh, I guess, specialist 
uh, someone like myself, you know, uh, to be sitting next to your writers and really going through everything. But before you go there, you've got to be able to understand that you're remotely in the right circle of, um, you know, you're in the right league, you're in the right range, your theme, your subject matters, you know, and the whole tone of the story is what your audience wants, is your, what your platform wants, you know, that, that's. Yeah, so I think we were, we were just saying, you know, watch the cheese gags because they don't, they, they, they don't resonate. I've, um, because we need to close shortly, um, I've just, we're, we're just waiting for Ching, uh, who will hopefully be with us shortly. Something, one of the questions was about songs and whether, so very, just very quickly, does the panel feel that songs and music works or is important within within programs? Trevor, what, what does music mean for you? Well, I studied music for quite a while, so it's actually very <laughs> important. Uh, um, and it's something that I've been trying to, people have asked me um, to uh, develop a show that has music as a very strong component. Um, so it's always been in the back of my mind and, you know, we'll like, fi I'll find ways to kind of like flex that a little bit. So I had one episode of Boomy where I had the characters, one of the characters rapping, for example, and, you know, uh, one of the characters played violin. I played violin for 11 years. So I kind of weave it in like sort of secretly right now, but uh, I do hope to one day develop a show uh, that has music as a bigger component because I do think it's something that obviously, as James mentioned, it really depends on the type of music, but I think that I have perhaps um, a sense of what could work musically here in China as well as overseas. So that's something that I'll be looking to develop because I do think there's an appetite for that. Thank you very much. We've not got much time left. So I just took, I've got just a question to Simon and a question to Pablo and then and then we're going to have to wrap I'm afraid so, Simon in terms of going back to the virtual and how people can can work virtually have you found that easy and have you found explaining your story easy it's very fortunate that the shows I work on are all animated so everyone's busy at work sort of fragmented into their little houses and apartments everywhere um, yes I've had quite a few writing meetings and about Battle of the Bugs as well um, and you've been doing that for years as well. I, I've seen you going around the world doing writer's rooms. I have done, yes, absolutely. And that's always been virtual. Um, although I have to say, I really like meeting writers and producers face to face. Um, and it's, it's difficult, it's difficult. But I think as long as it, it's an encouragement to become even clearer and even more um, direct in how one communicates across a screen rather than in person. And it, it is doable. For a yeah, time. Back to Trevor's point. Um, Pablo, you just very, very briefly, you mentioned your educational product, which I know if it was available in the UK, many people would be would be using. Are you also looking for people with ideas outside pure animation? Uh, yes, actually, um, we've kind of helped, we, we've, we've kind of held back from uh, buying or acquiring or representing animated series or IPs from overseas for a while, but uh, the doors for pure educational content is still open. And in fact, we've been, uh, we've been uh, trying to acquire um, content from like Oxford Press, um, etc. Et et on the uh, preschool learning um, side of things, uh, things like phonics, uh, et, et, et cetera. Obviously it, it doesn't have to be linear. linear. That, that's what our product really is for. It could be non-linear, it could be interactive. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry, I'm gonna to have to cut this short. I could go on, I, we could have done a whole webinar with each of you for, for ages. So thank you very much. And I'm going to, to sum up and um, thank everybody, both in this session and the previous session um, as, as we, we close. So I want, as I say, to thank the speakers. I particularly want to thank um, Chris, who has been behind the scenes and CBBC, who, is not 
uh, British Broadcasting, but the China Britain British Council, who have been a huge support to us in terms of talking about what we can do and particularly setting up the webinar, which was a first to us all. Um, an even bigger thanks to DIT, both uh, in, in London and in China. We couldn't have done this without them. That we've turned this round from a gem of an idea into something that's happened in two weeks. So thank you so much for everything. Um, and for everybody else, you know, Darren behind the scenes, who's been um, a superstar, as have uh, Lauren, Jackie, Greg, everybody else. So thank you so much to all of you. We'd also like to say that we wouldn't be doing this today without IABC and our friends at CCAF, that we would normally, as I said earlier, be going out to Hangzhou in a group and really immersing ourselves in how we do business with China. We have done great deals while we've been out in China and really em embraced what, what it is that we can do to co-produce, to work together. There are huge business opportunities. As Jean said earlier, there is a huge and growing kids market there. So if we can work together and work out ways of doing that, that would be brilliant. For those that aren't on the meetings this week, you can go online to sign up for next week's virtual IABC meetings, which are going to be held uh, virtually, but from China. So please do, if you've missed out this week or you want a second bite, go to the URL that's on the screen or go to the, um, the website for the Children's Media Conference. I also have to do a bit of um, uh, housekeeping, which is in order for the DIT to continue to support us, they really need to know what you know, how useful this was. I hope that the information we've given you has been useful. Please do keep coming back to the CMC website because there will be more coming through. We're going to be doing a, a lot more virtually with CMC. So within the CMC community that we're going to be running webinars every week and we're going to be doing one this Friday which is the kids in time of corona that there will be a whole series which again can be accessed through the CMC website as we close you will get a survey from the DIT and we'd be really grateful if you could fill that in so I'm going to close and let you go all go to your 11 o'clock Thank you so much for bearing with us with, a, with um, various things that have happened, but um, you are as important to us and working with you is, is incredibly important to the British economy to get everybody up and running as quickly as we can and working with China is one opportunity for you. So thank you.